Thanks. I think it's something I've been working on um, for a couple of months, and now I did the first announcement um, like two weeks ago. And yeah, this is my first talk about it, so uh, um, yeah, congratulations that you've make, made it to my first talk about this. Um, CA Sync is a new tool that is very much like a lot of other tools, but also very different. Um, yeah, so what is it? Uh, like the name already suggests um, that it's content addressable. I mean, that's what the CA is supposed to mean. And the sync is supposed to mean that it's a little bit like rsync. Everybody here, I presume, knows rsync. Does anybody know, not know rsync? Wow, everybody knows it. Very good. So, yeah, so it tries to combine the two uh, core ideas of content addressable file systems. Like, content addressable file systems is what Git is, right? Like, everybody here knows Git too, right? Like, I mean, you do, right? So it tries to combine the two ideas of Git and of rsync, uh, that are at the core of rsync, into something new um, with a couple of different use cases. Uh, we'll come to that later. So, um, yeah, the long form of what it means is a content addressable data synchronization tool. Um, it's a file system tree synchronizer for cases where you have many similar trees. Specifically, the use cases are that uh, you, you might have an OS tree, like, a, like something like a Debian or a Fedora or whatever installation that you want to synchronize about, um, across uh, uh, multiple systems and in multiple versions, right? Um, so it could be an OS tree, container tree, IoT tree, VM image, it doesn't really matter, it's kind of all the same. It's all about um, shipping lots of different uh, directory trees or file systems um, over the internet um, and keeping them updated in, in, in a high frequency. Uh, it has a couple of other use cases too, like for example, um, it uh, can be useful for synchronization of uh, your home directory and it can be useful for backup. But uh, to be truly useful for that, we still need to add a couple of things, but I'll talk about that later. So, the primary thing, however, is delivery of um, OS images. And I'm pretty sure. Like most people who came here probably have some use case um, of that in some form or another. So you, I don't know, you manage some container uh, system um, on the internet or you do uh, IoT development or something like that or you uh, work with VMs. And the, the thing is supposed to speed up there is the image delivery. Yeah, so CA Sync can work on two, two different layers. First of all, it can work on the block layer. The block layer is like direct access to dev SDA or something like that. Um, in that case, uh, what it can do for you is basically deliver file system images, right? Like you have an XT3 image or an XFS image or a SquashFS image, and that's what it will deliver for you as a um, binary explicit um, image to the other side. It can also operate on the file system level. In that case, it doesn't do the block layer thing, it instead operates on the level of files and directories, right? In other words, it works kind of like a tar thingy, but a little bit better. So um, through the entire thing, like through, through the entirety of CA Sync, these two different layers are, are visible, right? So yeah, let's talk a little bit about what it's actually now really doing. I mean, from everything I talked about, like I just compared it with a couple of things and told you what kind of is used for, but you still don't have any feeling what's actually going on there. So yeah, let's have a little bit, uh, a little bit of a discussion about what's actually the technical background. So, um, the first thing that system uh, that uh, CA Sync saying does when you run it, it will first serialize all things. If we operate on the block layer, that's easy. We can just read off the blocks from the block device, like kind of like DD would do. If we operate on the file system layer, we just serialize the directory tree the same way as tar does, because that's exactly what tar is. It goes through a directory tree and generates a serialization out. The second step of what CA Sync will do for you is it will take this huge serialization, right? Like that's the idea that it's huge. Split it up. Split it up uh, means uh, chop it into a series of chunks. Chunk is a special word for block. And uh, the interesting thing about this is that these chunks do not have all the same, si same sizes. Instead, they have variable sizes. That's actually a key feature. And it's kind of the idea that rsync um, came up with or pioneered in, in everybody's lives. Um, that it does that. What precisely does it do there? It basically go goes through the entire stream and uh, chops things into, into, into these chunks. But the, the actual, when it puts one of these chunk boundaries, is dependent on the contents of the chunk. The idea behind that is that the same data will result in the same chunk size. 
The benefit is um, if you have a large serialization and next day you serialize the same um, directory tree or block device again, right? And very little thing, a few things um, change, like for example, you added another file in some directory at the beginning, right? That um, uh, the chunks that are, that are generated from this are mostly the same except for some local uh, uh, <coughs> chunks around the actual change that you made, if you follow what I mean, right? Like if, you, if the, the other option, of course, is, is, is to always pick equally sized chunks. If you do that and you add one byte to the beginning of the serialization, then of course all the chunks all the way to the end will change because in every single chunk, one byte will be uh, flushed out, basically. It will all be moved to the right. So the core idea really is um, do not use fixed uh, size chunks, but use um, uh, variable size chunks and make the chunk size dependent on the contents. Um, so yeah, adding an extra byte at the front should not ripple into all the following chunks. It should stay local. The algorithm this is implemented with is an algorithm called bushash. Bushash is a hash function. Like everybody here, I presume, knows what a hash function is in one way or another. Uh, bushash is a special one. It's a so-called cyclic hash function. Um, it basically allows you to, um, to very efficiently calculate the, the hashes of a, of a block of memory and then calculate the hash of the block of memory that is shifted by one byte to the right, if you follow what I mean. So it basically, it's very efficient if you have a window that you pass through our serialization, for example, and calculate from every window, every overlapping window that the serialization has, the checksum. Um, yeah, it's extremely um, efficient for that. Now, what CAsync does after it has a serialization goes through um, the serialization with this bash hash algorithm, basically calculates um, the hash function um, over every single window, and if the hash value that is calculated like that um, matches a certain test, then we'll put a chunk boundary, right? So the idea there is same data results in the same hash value, and if the hash value um, matches that specific test, we put a chunk, and that's the goal that we wanted, same data results in the same cuts. But um, different data results in different cuts. Um, the test actually used, just for the ones who care, is completely trivial. It's just if h is the hash value that we calculate and we do modular calculation compared with q minus 1. It basically means that by picking q, um, we can choose what the average chunk size shall actually be. Right? If you pick uh, q uh, small, then this test h modulo q equals q minus 1 um, will um, uh, be true very, very frequently. And if you um, use q in a large value, then it won't. Uh, yeah, I talk a, lot, a little, little bit too much about the theoretics about this. Um, it's, it's not very hard, so I kind of hope that you've got some things here that I was talking about. But uh, yeah, to use it, you actually don't have to care about all of that. So, the first two steps were serialization of everything, chunking things up. The third step now is, after we got all these chunks, we calculate a strong hash value of each of these chunks. The, ha the hash function used is SHA-256, everybody knows that, I presume. Um, now, this is where the idea of Git now gets into play. Because now we can use this strong hash function, like the, the hash value that we calculate for each chunk for that, for identifying the chunk. So at the same time as we do that, we actually write out a so-called index file. The index file is nothing more than the list of the chunk hashes, right? So the index file will now describe our serialization perfectly, right? Because it just says, yeah, you first have to put the, the chunk with the hash uh, with the hash value so and so, then next one is the chunk with the hash value so and so, and so on and so on and so on, and there you go. The fourth step now is, we take the chunks that we already generated, compress them individually, and stick them in some directory as regular files that are named after the hash value and have its contents and com compressed contents of the chunks, right? So that's super trivial. Like, uh, it's kind of nice because you can actually use the SHA-256 command that you get on the shell, like, like from GNU Core Utils, you can just invoke it on the, on the, on the files and it'll just return you the file name of the, the thing. So, and that's already everything CAC kind of does. Um, so, to recapitulate, it has four uh, steps. The first one is that, was that serialization. The second one was splitting everything into chunks. The third one was 
um, uh, calculating the strong hashes of these chunks and writing the, out the index for it. And the fourth one is taking the uh, chunks um, and store it in the, in the, in the uh, chunk store. Of course, um, while this, I, I, I pretend that these are four separate steps, CSync does them all at the same time so that it's streamable and everything. But uh, just for theory, it's easier to <coughs> pretend it would do all that one after the other. That's a question. Uh, yeah, uh, there's been recently attack against Git because SHA-256 is actually not that strong. They use SHA-1, they don't use SHA-256. Uh -huh, okay. So you what if there will be similar attack if SHA-256 is broken on... Yeah, so the question was was uh, regarding uh, the choice of hash functions. Uh, we use SHA-256 there and there was um, very widely reported the vulnerability in SHA-1. Um, so, um, yeah, you have to pick something. I don't really care what we pick. If we pick this at the point in time right now, that's fine, right? And it eventually won't be, but it doesn't really matter, right? Like, if you, if, as long as CA Sync understands what it's good, like, we have to go with times, and yeah, there will probably be eventually when SHA 256 is going to be broken, there will be another version of CA Sync that uses SHA 512 or whatever is current at that point in time. But at, at this point in time, SHA 256 is plenty safe. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> if a chunk is corrupt or broken or something, how much do you lose? Well, you, you lose a chunk. Just a chunk to access. Yes. So the question was, uh, like, if I lose a chunk um, by, by storing it or something, how much do I actually lose? And the answer to that is you, you use that chunk. The chunk is basically the smollest entity that ch the CA sync ever has. So I can see it by store and, like, most yeah. Let's talk about restoring a little bit later. I have some slides about that, but yeah. Uh, Alban, you had a question. Um, what size of chunk do you typically use? It's a very good question. Like the question was, uh, what chunk size is the typically one used? Um, there's no clear answer like that. Like, I mean, everything that I've talked about is not novel in any way, right? Like everything that I was talking about has been implemented in other systems already. Not in discrimination, but the concepts are far from new. They are 1983 <laughs> or something, um, and, and, and nothing new. But um, so there's lots of prior art, and what CA Saint defaults to now is 64K as average chunk size. Um, the minimum, like, um, it will not permit super small chunks, though. It will enforce um, a minimum chunk size of a fourth of that. And it will um, uh, uh, enforce a maximum chunk size that's four times of that. Right? So, um, yeah, so 64K is the, the average. But it really depends on the use case. You might want to actually play around with that, but we'll talk about that later, right? Like sometimes you want smaller ones, sometimes you want bigger ones, completely up to you. One of the key features is actually that it gives you that control. When you talk about minimum and maximum, that's a minimum and maximum compared to the average chosen chunk size. So uh, if, if I choose the average chunk size of, six, of 100K or something, then it will always break up a chunk larger than 400k, even though the hash doesn't match the special yep. model. Yeah, but actually, uh, so the question was if that's, uh, if these uh, four times and the fours are always dependent on the average one you pick. Uh, CA Sync actually permits you to, to choose all three values as you wish, but usually it's not what I would suggest people to do. I mean, just like, I think the four times and the fours is okay, and then just pick the average one, forget about the other ones. But you can do whatever you want. Like, I mean, the, 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 the statistics of that are not trivial, right? Like, um, uh, the average chunk size is, is, is a function of, um, of, of this uh, module test, actually. Like, I mean, if you pick Qs, that would be something, then there's still some kind of calculation involved to actually come to it. But yeah, I don't want it to be that technical or mathematical to actually talk about that. Anyway, any questions? Otherwise, otherwise, I would proceed to actually extraction. <laughs> so, what about extraction? We simply reverse it, actually. So, first step, we acquire that index file. The index file, you remember, was just this list of uh, strong hash values. When we have that, we uh, acquire each chunk by downloading from that, or, or looking up in that um, chunk store directory, and uh, it uncompress it and just concatenate it again. So yeah, that's a third step. Concatenate the uncompressed um, uh, uh, chunks. And there we are, we have our original serialization. And then the fourth step is um, deserialize that serialization, bind it to disk again, either by 
by uh, if it's a, if it's a serialization of a of a file system, just write it like DD would write it to the block device or to some loopback file, whatever you choose. Or if it's on the file system tree level, it will, it will just be um, untarred, if you so well. Uh, that's kind of already everything there is to do. So the ideas are very very basic, right? I think I kind of hope that most of you got what this does, right? And it doesn't really get any more complex than that. This is the entire like computer science bits that are behind this. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit very briefly about so what does CAsync actually do different from rsync? The main, like, I mean, there are many differences, and this is no uh, intention to be in any way comprehensive. This is just the one key difference that I think um, is um, the most relevant, and that's fuck the file boundary. Because, I mean, that's what rsync is about. about. So what rsync does, right, everybody will be using it um, regularly, right, is that you specify some remote file tree and one local file tree. And then what rsync does, it goes through that file tree and looks at the end times of files when it finds two files with the same name on both of these sites. If the end times differ, um, the rsync algorithm, the actually interesting bit in rsync actually um, gets activated. That is, it starts doing the chunking algorithm, doing hash function, because rsync is pretty old, that the hash function is not sharp, 256, it's MD5 originally, and then got updated a couple of times. But, um, so, um, it uses basically the same algorithm, but it, it primarily, and, 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 and it originally, it's always about the file boundary for them, right? If two files don't bear the same name, the rsync algorithm won't actually do anything for you. Right? If, the, if the two files um, uh, uh, don't bear the same name, rsync is no better than SCP is, for example, or some other tool you use. Right? So they're actually interested. I mean, most people who use rsync probably have never have actually realized that the smart bit of rsync only is when it finds two files with the same name but um, slightly different contents. So the key difference here to, from rsync to ca sync is. In CSync, we really don't care about individual files. We first serialize and then we split up. We don't um, stay on the file level first and only split up after we found two similar files. And that is a major difference because it basically means we lump um, in our chunks um, small files together, right? And small files are everything, right? Like if you if you if you look at a Linux. Uh, directory tree. In Etsy, for example, you have a shitload of very small files. Etsy host, Etsy host name, all these kind of things. They have like, I don't know, some of them have 10 bytes, some of them have 100 bytes, but that's still very, very small. That's no way until the, uh, you reach a chunk size. With CA sync, that's really nicely handled because all of them are lumped together until the average chunk size and the test holds and you, you chunk it up. Also, the reverse um, applies too. Large files are nicely split up by CA sync into individual chunks. So what uh, CAsync gives you as a nice guarantee is that the chunks that it spits out really have the average chunk size, regardless how small or how big the individual files were that you actually put into CAsync. All right? So yeah, they are uh, evenly sized. And another effect that is really important is CAsync, because it um, doesn't care about the file boundary, is actually really good at finding um, similar areas in different files. And that basically means that if you uh, move a file in the directory tree, if you just rename it, if you, if you copy it, CAsync will recognize that because it doesn't really care um, uh, uh, about file names because it doesn't really require two files on both sides to have uh, the same name and then doing the end time thing and so on because it, it will just recognize the same data regardless where it is in that serialization. And if it's around 10 times in serialization, or if it's at that place, or at that place, it doesn't matter. It will always result in the same chunk. And um, yeah. So that's a major difference to rsync. I'm not saying, by the way, that rsync is bad. It's absolutely not. It's, 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 it's stellar computer science, um, especially since nobody else did that before. And, but it has a very different use case. It's for synchronizing directory trees like um, individual. Um, CA sync doesn't really do that. CA sync is the use case is that you have lots of very similar trees that you update in a lot of frequency and you have lots of clients that actually pull them down. Now, um, why do we do all this? Um, the really good effect is that if you have a lot of uh, very similar trees, 
the chunks will be mostly the same that are generated, right? You have this um, chunk repository, the, the chunk store, where you add a couple of chunks, but you only add the chunks that haven't been used before. That basically means if you have your container tree and you keep working on it, right? And um, today um, you have that version and then you notice a bug and um, tomorrow you fix that bug and want to deploy that again. Um, the directory tree will be mostly the same, right? You change one binary effectively or, or, or one text file or whatever you change, but pretty much everything else will stay the same. And that has automatically the effect that the two container trees will reside in the same chunks except for the few chunks actually around the stuff that you changed. So it's a, it's a very efficient storage for storing lots of, of, of uh, very similar or relatively similar um, directory trees like you have if you do high frequency updating of containers, if you do high frequency updating or even not high frequency, if you do any kind of updating of container trees, IoT trees, um, VM trees, whatever you call it, right? So, but that, that's kind of the key, like CNC is something you shouldn't be using if you only have one copy of everything because it doesn't matter. It's really about something where you want to wanna deliver many repetitive similar things. Um, another really important um, uh, concept for SA Sync, everything in CSync Sync is um, like reproducible and trusted. That means um, CSync Sync cannot be used to deliver like manipulated data because um, every single chunk um, is protected by the strong hash um, value and the index file describes the entire serialization um, when we access it, when we extract it, you get the guarantee, you get exactly the same serialization as before. This is unlike, for example, tar. It's very easy, like if you have a tar ball and you go to, like you can edit it this vim if you like and change it by then, it will not be recognized, right? Um, so as long as the index file is protected, the entire serialization is um, um, uh, protected. And that's something that is similar to DM Verity is basically. Do you actually check the hash on instructions? Of course. I mean, that's kind of the idea. Um, this is supposed to be a secure system, like right? it's, it's what you want. There's no, like in today's world, we live in a world where, where we know that the NSA and Russians or whoever else hack systems all the time. So I think it's the absolute duty that everything that is down on all the OS uh, um, images, all the VM images, all the container images are validated on download and ideally even on access. So yeah, I think it's, that's a core of it and we do it all the time. Security That's a very good question. Um, uh, so this stuff is designed to be used with HTTP or something similar. Like, uh, so the question was, how do I actually transfer the, the index file? Um, well, the idea is that everything is HTTP. Like, I mean, because the world is HTTP. Um, this stuff is designed to be very friendly to HTTP and the way people use HTTP these days, meaning um, content delivery networks. So, I mean, that's kind of the effect of the, of the average chunk size stuff because it's really nicely cacheable and um, uh, you can make the best of your CDN because you don't get the huge files of your OS tree that, that every day you lump on the CDN and, and, and nobody can cache. Um, so, uh, yeah, but the idea is that the index file is, is you get that through some second channel, meaning um, you get some through HTTPS and you do a GPT verification. Right? Um, but the idea is basically, as soon as you have the index, um, everything else is, is, is stable. Right? Uh, right now, CA-Sync doesn't do the verification for you, right? Like, it expects that you somehow acquire this, this CA index. It's like a torrent file, if you so well. Right? It assumes that the, that the, that the index file is trusted already. Um, but uh, I plan to change that, actually, so that um, CA-Sync can actually invoke GPG for you and automatically download it and detach the G signature. So because, I mean, that's how you have to deploy it, otherwise it's pointless, right? If the, CA, if the index file is not trusted, then the rest falls apart too. If you have a HTTP cache, um, how do you garbage collect the wrong things? It's a very good question, we currently don't. Um, <laughs> but of, so the question was, how does a garbage collection happen? And the answer to that is, uh, it doesn't um, at the moment. But uh, I'm working on that actually. But uh, uh, the idea is like, uh, I mean, it, it's basically you specify, you tell CA Sync about a couple of these index files that you actually still care about, and then we'll just remove everything from the store that it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, isn't show, showing up in these index files, right? But it's, uh, it's not implemented, but it's, yeah, I don't know. It's not very hard to do. 
Um, yeah, DM Verity, for those who know, is like this thing that it's, it's something that Chrome has invented. It's like a, like a, a system <laughs> where basically every single disk access is cryptographically verified at access time, which is excellent because it basically means that uh, offline uh, changes are not possible. I, I was talking with, with you about that earlier, actually, with um, like other systems that are a little bit like this, like Westry, for example, they tend not to protect against that. They will do verification at the moment of download, but not after. Um, CSync, you can use in both modes actually. CSync can download something for you, and from that point on, it's on you. And if, if it's man manipulated, it's your problem. But you can also use it in a mode that I will describe a little bit later, where you basically say, yeah, um, verify every block, uh, get every block as it's needed, and verify it. But yeah, let's talk about that a little bit later. Um, I already mentioned that it's, it's very CDN friendly. It's like you choose the average block size, and by making it large, you um, I mean, CDN uh, uh, prices are usually by requested object, if I remember correctly. And so um, by tweaking the average um, uh, 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 chunk size, you have the freedom to say, yeah, I want many requests, or I want few requests. It's like a, a trade-off between how much you want to pay the CDN provider and how much you actually want to, um, uh, like, I mean, the larger the chunks get, the less can be reused on the client side, right? So um, that's a... It's, if you do that kind of stuff, uh, it gives you a little bit of control. How much money do you want to spend and how much does your customer uh, shell spend? So, um, why all this part two, which is a really important um, concept here, is when acquiring a new version of some directory tree, for example, we can use, if we already have an old version of some form, that as a chunk source, like as, as a seed. Um, the way that it's done is basically we apply the same algorithm, right? So let's, let's say an example. You have a container image and uh, you deploy that on a server and the next day you deploy the next version of the server. What the downloader, what CA Sync uh, can do for you is um, it can index the first one the same way, like go, go through the serialization, generates the chunks, has a, the, the hashes for you. And then on the second day when you update the, uh, try to update the thing, it will download the index file, look at it, figure out, oh, that chunk I already have from yesterday and that chunk I already have from yesterday, let's just copy that over from, from what I already have. Let's only download <coughs> the few chunks that actually changed, right? And that's key. And that's not only useful for updating container images, it's updating for pretty much anything because you always do have an old version if you do an update, so you should be able to make, make use of whatever you have. And the good thing is that all of this happens fully automatically, right? You do not have to, to, to tell it anything. It will just find the similarities completely automatically for you. Um, if you have an IoT um, device, usually you have this A-B setup. Like you have one partition A and one partition B. And then in partition A, you have the operating system that you currently have booted. And in partition B, you have the one that you booted last or that you're going to update to next, right? So that you always have two versions of the operating system that are, that are in an entirely clean state. And um, yeah, one is always the one you run, and the other one is the one you're going to run next. So with the async, that matches natural this design, because you basically say, if I'm booted from, from uh, partition A, then I'm using partition A as seed and writing to partition B. And then I reboot to partition B, and if I update that one again, I use B as a seed and write to A again, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, important question about that. You said earlier that you have, when you run the algorithm on some on the existing file system, that you have to build up the, the storage. Does that mean you have to copy from that into the hashed filing thing? Uh, well, I mean, um, the way the seeding works is I go through everything and I just remember where it was. Uh, so, uh, cool. so you can, when you, when you apply it to the other disk, you can hope the other things are references. Yes. So, so, so basically, seeding is really like, it's, it's really, yeah, I think my answer implies the question, actually, in this case. Um, the, uh, so, so the seeding is really uh, um, about not having to copy anything around unless I can actually make use of this. Awesome. So, um, does, the seeding also, does the seeding also work with a file system tree? I mean, the error yes. remembering is a bit, bit more difficult. Right? Yes. But I mean, that's, that's why I solved these problems, really, because I <laughs> No, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, like, so the question was regarding, uh, isn't that much more difficult if we actually do that not on the block layer, but on the file system layer? Because in that case, we have, we cannot just jump to one specific position. The specific position is a path plus an offset, plus actually a couple of more files that might come after it where the chunk still goes over. 
But uh, yeah, it's, it's all in there, it's all for you, and it works uh, really nicely, actually. What happens when the file system tree changes? Uh, that's fine, because I, I um, so the question was, what happens if the file system tree changes while the seeding takes place, and while we, like, between the time the seed happened and we did <coughs> usage of it? Um, the thing is, um, if we go through it and calculate the hashes of, of these chunks, and remember them, and remember where we got, got them, and then later actually need them because they are referenced in the new version, then we will read the block, we'll verify it again because, yeah, we have the hash, so we check it. If we notice it's actually not matching, we throw it away and download the, the chunk anyway, right? So it's completely robust against that, right? And it, it, that's an, actually an excellent thing, right? Like, because um, you can throw any kind of shit at it and it will do the right thing and you can still keep modifying the original shit while it uses it as a seed, it's completely fine. So I think we'll deal with it for you. Um, um, so this means uh, today I can download uh, or deploy my images to devices with eight megabyte chunks, and tomorrow I can do this with one megabyte chunks. Uh, and if the device already have it deployed and running, it will find uh, yeah. them again. So uh, yeah. So the question was regarding uh, what happens if uh, I download today. Uh, was, uh, and then and everything was uh, put together for a specific chunk size and the next day for a different chunk size. Um, so uh, when a new index file is downloaded that's supposed to be applied, um, the index file contains metadata. It's not actually just a pure list of, of uh, hashes. It also contains information about the desired chunk size. Right? So it will download the index file, will then start seeding, um, and then uh, will actually uh, make use of that. So you can change that that as you like, of course, um, if you have a central chunk store and you keep changing the, the average chunk size and you can't reuse any chunks, that's up to you. You need to know that, of course. Yeah, but just the whole row, watch the device at the end, don't need to download everything again. Yeah. Cool. So the seed will stay, stay useful, but the chunk store might not be if you keep changing the average <coughs> chunk size. I have a question. Uh, so the the test you have, the modulus thing, is that stored some, is that reliable somehow in the metadata or can you, can you change the test completely in the future? Will it be compatible? Well, um, so the question was regarding uh, whether the test, like the modulus test, um, uh, uh, can be changed. Um, well, you, of course you can change, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a disformative break, right? Like, I mean, if the, the entire um, thing is designed so that we can make incremental changes in the format um, sooner or later, but that would be one. If we actually change the test, yeah. But uh, I mean, you know, the test isn't like it's. Everybody does a test like the same way since 1983. I don't see anything changing in that area. The hash functions they will are likely to be swapped out eventually, and and other things. But I don't think the test matters. I think it's boring. But uh, you're the mathematician, so what do I? Um, any other questions? So this test the same as rsync does? Well, rsync, so the question was, is it the same, uh, was it, is it the same test that rsync does? So rsync uses slightly different algorithms. Like, I mean, 30 years passed since that thing came out. Uh, by the way, it's a lie that it's 83. I think it's 93 or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, things uh, uh, have changed since then. So they do not use bus hash. They use something called atlas 32 uh, which is something that came out of GZIP development, which is also one of these cyclic hash um, functions. Um, uh, bus hash is, is faster, and the results are uh, not cryptographic, but much more like cryptographic hash, hash, hash functions than Atlas 32 is. Um, uh, the test ultimately is always the same. Well, I mean, some people, like, I mean, there, there are other systems, like there's one backup system called Rustic, for example. They don't do modular check. They, they do a check where they, they only permit chunks of multiples of uh, 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 exponents of two. And then instead of doing the modular check, they do some binary um, thing. But it's kind of the same thing, except that I accept any kind of block size that they don't. So, yeah. Um, uh, when you try CSync, are you limited by the CPU uh, memory memories or uh, disk memories or network? So the question was uh, where, uh, where what the what the limiting factor is for running CSync, where the speed is. That really depends. Like um, we currently use like the compression, like the, the CSync will natively compress with XZ, and XZ is slow, and that's kind of the 
main thing right now, right? Like, so if you if you actually create a disk image with this, like if you chunk it up and, and create the NX file, blah blah blah, um, the, the limiting thing is is like that. Uh, it's probably one of the things we'll replace by something faster, like with, with like with Facebook algorithm, which I forgot the name of, something standard zip or something. <laughs> yeah, it has a very nice name, just calling itself standard. Maybe I should have called <laughs> CA standard. Um, everybody knows that my, that everybody use, should use that as a standard. But uh, I don't know. It, that's like so. That's currently the, the limiting thing. If you download. Uh, CA sync is really, really easily can uh, completely uh, fill up your 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 network link um, because what downloading is first the index file, but as it has that, uh, then it can go on and and uh, download the chunks all in parallel, right? Like because it just knows them, and that basically means uh, like CA sync to deal with that stuff because if you build an IoT device, it's probably not a good idea to uh, do shitload of you know, get requests all at the same time um, flooding the network. Uh, it actually has support for specified bandwidth to, to limit so that it won't take more, like because it won't download uh, in the background, not not uh, be the primary thing. Um, so really, you just struggle all that? Well, you, let me finish my slow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question was regarding fuse, but yeah. Um, so uh, one more really really important thing is. Um, the difference from this to, to other systems is there's no revision control necessary, right? Meaning, um, what, what I mean by that is that CA Sync will recognize similar data automatically for you, right? There is no requirements to ever tell CA Sync this is the old version <coughs> and this is a new version and version numbers and anything like that. It will just figure out everything automatically. If it can reuse something, it reuses it. If it can't, it can't. Um, this is excellent because um, you know, um, Debian and Fedora, for example, they are very similar systems. Um, with CA Sync, you can actually do cross updates. You can use a Debian image as a seed and generate a Fedora image of it. It will, of course, be much less, uh, can, can reuse much less because it compiles different compilers, things like that. But it will still be able to reuse a lot of data. Like, for example, time zone data is a huge blob that is actually kind of the same on, on all systems. So, um, yeah. And even though Fedora and Debian don't have a common history in any way, like your, your distribution that you put together with, with the tools do not have a common history, CA Sync doesn't care. It will, will take whatever it can. Um, so uh, one more key difference um, that I really want to put um, uh, uh, like the emphasis on is the key difference is fuck revision control. I don't think that revision control has, should ever be part of image delivery. And Docker, for example, kind of employs it, like because the Docker has this thing where they have a table and then they have the Delta table and the Delta table and the Delta table. To actually deploy an image on, on some system, it basically means you have to, to, to download all those tables. And because people hate that, then they flatten things and then they kind of the Docker model goes out of the window. But the key difference here really is um, there is no revision control because revision control has no place on the deployed device. Revision control is a tool for the developer and not for a deployment. So yeah, CA Sync won't do that for you. Um, it will find things automatically and doesn't really care if there's any kind of historical relationship between anything. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of nice. Like for example, Docker, like the way how people build their images is they always start off from the same image, right? Like they always take the Ubuntu image, the official one, and then make the changes from that. And that's the only way how the delta is actually meant to stay small. But in this case, it really doesn't matter. You can actually take apt-get and and that bootstrap, whatever, and build the, your image every day completely from new. And it's entirely fine if you do that, because CA Sync will automatically recognize some of the narratives and there will not be a difference. Um, yeah, any questions to this point? Otherwise, yeah, I already mentioned that, um, that uh, what system does, uh, what <laughs> where's, the, where's the serialization of the directory tree is a lot like tar. I'm very sure everybody here knows tar, um, but it's just a lot like tar. It's not tar. Um, that's for two reasons. Like actually, like uh, um, CA sync, you can actually use the tarring part, the serialization part of CA sync, completely independently of the rest of CA sync, like without the chunking, without the hashing, and, and so on. Um, where you can just say, "Give me the serialization of the directory tree," and we call it dot. CA tar files instead of tar files uh, because all our file endings start with a CA. 
And uh, yeah, it's really like a tar, but it has some really nice properties um, that tar does not offer, and which is the reason why I do not use tar for this. Um, the, for me personally, most interesting one is the reproducibility. Um, with CA tar, by the definition of the former, there's a guarantee that one directory tree can only have one a specific bytes exact serialization. There's only one valid one of that. That basically means that if you have a serialization, you calculate the hash function, or like the ha any hash of it, it's, it's a guarantee that the original directory tree matches what you think it matches. This is different from tar, right? Uh, in tar, because the, 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 the entries can appear basically in any order and nobody else bothered to specify anything there, um, and because the, the, the former that has so many variables basically, there are any number of uh, valid serializations of the same directory tree. Some of the implementations of tar try to fix that, but um, uh, so that they give you the guarantee that if you use that tool to generate a tarball of that directory tree, then it will always be only one and one only. But um, that's, in, that's in that case a, a property of the implementation, not a property of the, of the LC format itself. Um, in CA tar, um, the idea really is everything is strictly reproducible. And that's one minute of um, serialization. Uh, another major change from CA tar to tar is that it's random access. <coughs> Meaning, if you want to jump to a specific file and directory in the serialization, um, you can do that in, in better than O of n time. You can do it in um, O log n time uh, multiplied by the depth of the uh, directory tree. Um, and that's 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 a major difference, right? Like because as your file uh, directories grow, the only way how you can jump to the one millionth file in a tarball is by iterating through the front um, 900,999 and so on uh, files first, right? And that's that's just a shitty performance. So yeah, these two things are the major differences. There are a couple of others. Um, Having random access is actually excellent because it basically allows us to do fuse, as you just asked earlier. Because um, if we can jump in in an excellent time um, to any file in the serialization, we can do um, a fuse. We can basically expose like an archive as a as a, um, a fuse file system. We can mount it locally, and in the background, we can um, download via HTTP or whatever you like. Um, the chunks as you access them, but we c only have to download the chunks that actually are needed for that specific file. So, yeah. Um, just a little bit more about how it actually starts feeling. So, um, we have files that, and directories with one of these four um, suffixes. .caidx is uh, an index file for a directory tree. CAIBX is also an index file, but in this case for a block image, right? Like it's the difference between on the file system level or on the block layer. CATAR, I already mentioned, is just this it's a little light, <coughs> slightly better tar thing, right? Like it's a serialization of the directory tree. And .CASTR is the, the chunk store. Um, it's a directory in this case, right? It's a directory that has to have that suffix. Um, this is really all you need to know about the stuff that um, the CA sync will spit out, right? Like if you, if you actually pack up a directory tree, what it will spit out for you is one CAIDX file and then drop chunks in one CASTR um, directory. If you uh, do the same for a block device, it will instead generate one CAIDX and also drop stuff in CASTR. Um, okay, uh, something that also I really care about is metadata control. Metadata is all the little bits and pieces that you need to know about files and directories. Uh, met metadata, for example, is file ownership, like which user does, it, uh, does own this file. It sings like M time, modification time. It sings like ACL's extended attributes. Um, and uh, as Linux grew, it gained more and more and more and more bits of metadata. In CA sync, we try really hard to cover them all. But that comes in theory with drawbacks. Because, um, like, for example, uh, CA sync will save and restore for you the, the, like the, the, ch utter, the change attribute. File system attributes. I'm not sure if you know them. They're they are not that well known. It's like an additional bit field for every file. Um, the most important bit that you can set there, most well known, is one that's called immutable. And if you set that on a bit, you cannot actually change that file anymore. Now, um, CA tar uh, will serialize that, serialize that for you. The goal really is um, I want reproducibility, right? 
I want that one directory tree and in all its precision it can be serialized and can be replayed and you get the exact same uh, thing back. So you think it goes into a lot of detail to serialize all these little bits that actually nobody else tries to serialize them, but I try. Um, but this comes as a drawback, right? Because depending on a use case, you actually want a different amount of metadata serialized. For example, um, all of what I was just talking about, another use case for using that is uh, backing up my home directory every day. In that case, I don't really care about which user ID, which numeric user ID owned that home directory because um, if I want to back it up and restore it on some different machine and on this one I have user ID 1000, on the other one I have 1001, it doesn't really matter. I, I, like, um, the fact that the number is different doesn't change the fact that it's my uh, home directory. Too. Um, on the other hand, if you actually deploy a, a, a container image, the metadata is, uh, you want a lot more metadata. You actually care about the user ID of who owns it because that's how Unix access control actually works. On the other hand, you don't care about the modification time in that case because modification times are awful. Modification times, um, it basically means that if you compile um, the same file twice, like the same C file twice on this same day, um, and the exact same binary image results out of it, the same ELF file, it will still be different because one got done earlier and the other later, so it got two different end times. So generally, people who actually care about deploying um, uh, file system trees um, want to turn off the storing of end time. Um, yeah, CI Sync gives you full control of that. It has these, um, <coughs> it has these uh, switches. That, like LaTeX, for some reason, removed the double dashes. It's supposed to be dash dash with and dash dash without. I'm um, not good, good enough for LaTeX apparently to control that. But uh, what about access time? Uh, so the question was about access time. So access time is something that cannot be restored on Unix, uh, on Linux. Um, the only thing that you can change on Linux is the M time and the C time, not the access time. Uh, like there's simply no API for it, unless you go through the file system level and then do some weird shit. Um, uh, and uh, hence, I don't support it. It's that easy. I don't even support C times, to be honest. Um, I have a very good reason, but I forgot it. Uh, ask me another time, I'll tell you when I uh, uh, remember. So, uh, but the, I mean, M time is the one that matters. The other ones are not. And again, M time also does not matter in some other cases. Um, one question that is pretty interesting is like, if you do IoT, uh, frequently you ship your, your disk image as SquashFS. Now SquashFS, um, and for those who don't know, it's a file system like XT3 is, but uh, it's compressed and it's read-only. Um, and it's the best way I can ship things if you want to uh, um, distribute them very efficiently and if you want to uh, have them use very little space on your uh, um, embedded device. Now, SquashFS images are compressed, right? Compression is, in theory, a, a problem with CA sync, right? Because compression, if compression works correctly, like if, for example, if you would actually use a compressed tarball and stick that into CA sync, which it <coughs> totally can, it will totally accept that, like uh, basically give it to it as an already uh, serialized thing, then if on the next day, you generate the same tarball, but with one byte changed somewhere. Due to the compression, this one bit change that you might have done will explode into the entire rest of the, of the, of the compressed screen. Because that's how compression works, right? It tries to reduce, uh, remove uh, redundancies, and it basically has the effect, yeah, if you change one byte, it will explode to the rest of the, of the compression screen. Mm -hmm. Now, so yeah, if you, if you um, use a compressed tarball and put that as a pretend block device image into CA sync, it will happily do everything, but it's not going to be able to recognize much data. Because, yeah, I mean, it will up to that point where it's changed, but from that point on, from where it changed, it will not recognize anything. Now, SquashFS um, is also compressed, so one would assume it's also going to be shit. But it's not, because SquashFS, um, because it's random access, they need to be able to, f um, to locate the data that they need in random access it's not entirely compressed. What it does, it, it, it splits files into blocks, and these blocks are individually compressed. Um, but uh, finding these blocks um, is not compressed, and basically the, 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 it's, a, it's a concatenation of individualized blocks, but the compression always starts again after the block size has reached. Right? So, and that fact is actually good for CA-Sync, because it has the effect 
that changing one byte at somewhere in the front does not ripple through the entire um, image. Um, the, the, the blocks in the end will still be the same, right? So you can actually use Squash OS and um, CA Sync um, in combination, and it will still do good. Not as good as a non-compressed file system would do, but still pretty okay. Of course, um, you need to somehow sync up the block size that Squash OS uses, that uses a fixed block size, and the variable block size that uh, CA Sync does. And you have to sync them up in magic ways that I do not fully understand yet, but there is some research going on of people who try to figure out what the best way um, is. Because uh, my assumption is that the Squash FS block size needs to be substantially smaller than um, CA Sync block size for CA Sync to do best. That is a GitHub issue if you want to follow this, these discussions. Some people are looking for that. Um, I already mentioned that. For me, reproducibility is everything. So it's really about, like, I want that the entire trees can always be reproduced. Um, that's why you can actually, CA Sync um, has a couple of different verbs that you can use, like one is make one of these index files and, and, and store stuff and store it, one is to extract it. But there's also CA Sync Digest and CA Sync M3. CA Sync Digest calculates, um, I mean, as the name suggests, it calculates a digest over a directory tree. And what it does there, it will just serialize it, not actually care about the serialization, but calculate the, the Shasun of that serialization while it does that. So it's kind of like, you know how people use SHA-256 some on the command line to calculate the, the checksum of some um, uh, uh, file, like the contents of the file? With CA Sync Digest, you can do the same thing, but over an entire directory tree, and we'll give you one hash back and describes exactly um, uh, uh, the directory tree and all its metadata and everything. The metadata, again, you have control. You can use that thing with, with uh, with dash dash with and dash dash without to individually select the metadata bits that you actually want to have stored there. Um, and CA Sync M3 is kind of similar to that. M3 is something, it's a BSD concept, like the free BSD people came up with that it's, it's a manifest tree. It's basically a text format where you can, um, it, it just lists stupidly uh, metadata about files and directories recursively in a tree. Um, like, and, store, and, and contains metadata about them. I can show you how, yeah, let's actually do that. So um, let's come to the demo section. Can you actually read that? So um, if you invoke um, CA sync with dash help, you get this long help. Uh, what's interesting here is like it will list all the bits here at the end, at least uh, with the width and then the file system uh, properties that you can either choose to include in the archival or um, or the digest generation or not include. But uh, yeah, let's just invoke it with one command. I said CA sync digest. If I invoke that, it will calculate the digest of my current directory tree, and that's what you see here. And that precisely describes everything that was in the file uh, in that directory tree. Like, for example, if we now touch something here, for example, the directory build itself, um, <coughs> then the digest will change. But if I call it again, it will won't, right? Like, because it will always generate the same thing. And M tree is kind of similar to that. If you, I invoke M tree, then it spits out this stuff, which probably looks nicer if we make the font smaller. Um, and that's really, uh, it's not a format that I came up with, it's, it's, it's stolen from BSD because, yeah. And it's, it really just describes, uh, here's a file by that name, and it's a file, and it has this mode, and it has this size, and user ID, and group ID, and username, and group name, and time, and start 256 digest. But uh, yeah, this is just a side feature, actually. Let's actually use CA Sync to create an archive of this. Like if, from this directory tree, my development tree, uh, I mean, it's not an OS tree. Yeah, you want the font bigger again? It's not an OS tree in this case, it's just my development tree, but the CA Sync actually doesn't care what you have in there, of course. Um, so if we actually want to do a, an index file, we'll just do CA Sync make, give it a name, and run that. And now it takes a while. Um, there are some test files in there, so it's actually kind of large. Um, this takes a while. What you're waiting for here is XMAT. And there you go. It will also spit out you that, that um, uh, hash value. What it now generated is this index file, var tmp foobar.cadx, is 6 into 26k in size. And uh, yeah, if you look at it, it's kind of binary nonsense. Uh, nothing interesting there. Um, next to it, it actually uh, Put, uh, populated this directory default CARSDR. That is our uh, chunk store. If we actually look through that, uh, it looks like this. There are always these individual files. They're named after hash.xd. And if you actually use unxd-c, I think, 
for example, and uh, then do this, right? So I will now uncompress this file and calculate of the contents of that compressed file, um, the, the SHA sum, and then we'll actually see that this matches, right? So this, what I just calculated, and this, how the file is exactly the same. So it's kind of nice. I like this, this concept here that there is no metadata, no nothing. It's like you can actually go with your shell tools and introspect the store, and you will actually be able to validate everything and do all the nice stuff. Now, if we actually want to um, extract that, uh, we use CI sync again. Now we use extract. We specify the path to foobar.cadx. And uh, let's say we want to decompress it in some new directory here. Um, we call it CA sync copy, and that's what it do, does. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so one of the problems is because it's so accurate with all the metadata, um, some of the metadata cannot be um, extracted with, uh, without privileges. The um, thing is not particularly friendly with that. Let's uh, make the image again, but this time, um, we pick, oh shit. Uh, we pick a different set of metadata. Uh, what I added here is this without privilege. So I'll say, um, store everything that you can, but uh, leave out everything that is privileged, and everything that's privileged is supposed to be all the metadata that cannot be replayed again without actually having privileges. Like for example, that's file ownership, right? File ownership can only be changed by root, as everybody here knows. And hence, uh, I just exclude that now. But I will still include everything else, like modification time, whatever you like. Um, will it, this now use your default, uh, the, 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 what is it, store to, to not uh, calculate everything? So the question was, when will this use the store to not calculate? So the store is just where we put the stuff. Do you, you mean C? Yeah, C, sorry, yes. No, no, no. Like, uh, so um, uh, the C is something you have to specify. Like, for example, um, if we already had a version of all of this, we can specify it like this, but we currently don't. But uh, let's, uh, let's do it step by yeah, step. So, but, uh, sorry, but I'm sure, like, it's going to use the same store, right? The yeah. Default, uh, will it see that like something is yes. in there that, that yes. you calculate it? Yes. Won't, like, do yeah. all so the contents um, of the files are already in that chunk, right? But the metadata isn't. So any chunks, uh, because the metadata changed because I suppressed uh, uh, some data here now because I've kicked out everything that is privileged. So um, the chunks that contain any kind of metadata are going to be recalculated, but the chunks that are just pure payload, pure, pure file contents, they will be reused. Okay, cool. Can you show the reuse quota? I think I can. Um, I think I just have to specify that. Uh, so uh, this is in verbose mode, now it shows you what it's actually doing. And uh, it will, yeah, reuse chunks, 72% uh, so could, could reuse, right? And uh, basically all the remaining ones, uh, 652 minus 473, is uh, um, the chunks that it could not reuse. So. Can you show the size of the index file and compare it to the size of the directory? Uh, you see the, the, the directory with everything is 42 megabytes here in size, right? And uh, the um, the index file is uh, 28k. Um, yeah, and the, the store of both runs now. I mean, the store will now contain the chunks of both of the runs, so it will be a little bit larger than um, the uncompressed version. Maybe it's 24. Uh, okay, yeah, because everything is compressed, so it's 24 megabytes is currently in the store. Um, anyway, let's now, now we did the other version, now let's actually extract foobar this time properly. And do that in RTP. Um, call it like this. And there we go, it will now extract everything. <laughs> wow, maybe I shouldn't do that on a development tree. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was deep in <laughs> Uh, so that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, anyway, but uh, that's kind of the, the idea of it. Let's uh, return to the slides of, uh, again. Oh yeah, something, oh there are more questions. Uh, is there a chance to select without privilege on extraction? 
Uh, currently not, but it's on to-do list. So uh, the question was, uh, can you uh, pick the, the metadata option <coughs> that you want during extraction as well, so that the serialization contains more information than, the, than what you actually extract? And the answer to that is currently it's not supported, um, but it's just because it was too lazy. Uh, but the idea is definitely that that's possible. It has some drawbacks, however, because I mean, I'm all about reproducibility, and if you pack up a lot of metadata and then don't replay it, uh, but uh, pack it up again, uh, then it will necessarily not match anymore. But uh, like for example, our, our entire test case is really about just um, zipping things up, uncompressing them again, zipping things up, and always making sure that the uh, checksums match. Um, uh, I noticed you had an eight kilobyte chunk there, so the chunk size is before compression. Uh, yeah. So basically, we chunk everything up, and yeah. uh, that's the average chunk size. That's the one that's basically matters for pattern recognition, because basically, if, if Anything that's smaller than this uh, smallest chunk size will never be able to recognize and across the file. Uh, but it's not the one that actually is directly relevant for the CDNs. That's that's actually a pitfall that you have that is important. Like if you pick the average chunk size, it does not translate to the actual object size directly. Um, you still have to to uh, um, like incorporate um, the average compression ratio that your X stat is will be able to deliver for your compressed data. Does it do something with files with holes? Uh, well, it will. Yeah, so the question was, um, yeah, does it do something special for files with holes? So um, it, will, it won't do anything particular when compressing them. But um, when decompressing them, it's actually smart. And uh, uh, will, whenever it comes across a long series of zeros, it will um, generate them as holes. So um, it, it has no, 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 it won't serialize where the holes are and where aren't. But it will automatically always um, uh, make holes wherever it can to make things as efficient as possible. That's, uh, you can actually turn that off, though, because in some areas you don't want that, like if you memory map and things like that. But uh, I know that some people actually might want to have the ability that they actually can serialize files in exactly the, the, the holes that they have. Um, not currently implemented. It's on the to-do list, but it was a question mark on the to-do list here. Like, I mean, there's a long to-do list, actually. Um, because, uh, I mean, when we, we also don't do hardening for that purpose, but it's a different question. But uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about that, but I said against it for now. Um, since you first chunk and then compress, it means a big uh, file with uh, only holes will generate a lot of small files. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, so the question was uh, whether um, a big file, like, yeah, because we do compress, that is, the, if something's very well compressible, um, and you have a huge file that is very well compressible, then this will still mean, yeah, you get a lot of individual chunks, that's true. Um, any other questions? That was somewhere about apparently. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about what, what else it can do for you. One thing that's pretty interesting, like, if you use the seeding functionality, right? So where you basically specify, uh, for example, like we, let's say we do it on the file system level, and you have uh, one OS tree already in place, an old version, and now you download the new version, and you specify the old version as seed. Then um, system, uh, fuck, uh, <laughs> thing can actually um, take benefit of that, and if you desire so, instead of copying the files each time, actually create hard links, right? That, of course, comes with pitfalls. If these OS trees are manipulated, of course, the changes will propagate to the other one. So you probably don't want to do that unless you really know what you're doing. But it is something that OS tree does. And so I thought I'd implement that too. Uh, now, I think it's, it's useful if you have read-only trees, right? Uh, because then you have kind of a lot of read-only trees, and everything is just um, around once. But if you do not have read-only trees, and CA sync doesn't force you in any mode of having read-only stuff, then hard links can be uh, extremely useful. What I think is way better though than hard links <coughs> are ref links. Uh, ref links, for those who don't know, ref links are something that a couple of more modern file systems support that. It's like ButterFS does, Oracle FS does, new versions of XFS do, XT4 doesn't. Um, ref links are something where you basically can say, I can make a copy of a file, and uh, that's free because uh, the new copy will actually still point to the old version, except when somebody actually manipulates one of those two sides, then that copy on write takes place, and um, the, the files are basically split apart, right? 
um, ref links um, are much nicer than hard links because they are transparent to the applications. There is no propagation between if you use that tree or you use that tree. They, they, they will stay, like they will be copied out while writing. So the applications, they will not notice that there's any kind of magic going on that shares the blocks underneath. Um, it also has a big benefit of a hard link that it's actually on the, on, the, on the file system level, like below the file boundary. So what we can actually do um, is uh, uh, maintain ref links between two files, but only have parts shared, other parts not, right? Because it's, that's how, how things are, uh, usually, like that you only in, uh, change individual bits. Can I also get ref links by just extracting one C8 tar if there are similar or identical files in there? Uh, no, but that's an oversight. Uh, so the question was regarding if I um, decompress a C8 tar, if you also get ref links. Uh, currently, you only get ref links if you specify a seed, and then it will try to uh, link everything up on the seed. It's not uh, smart enough right now to do the ref linking from the, the extraction it's currently operating on. But that's mostly because I didn't bother like, hooking that up, um, because it's, it's a tiny bit more complex if you actually need to use as source what you currently extract instead of just the stuff that's already there and plain and then fully indexed. But it's only on my to-do list. Like you saw the to-do list, it's actually on that. Um, yeah, ref links are incredibly useful because they are transparent. It's actually like, for example, if you do a VM manager, right? Uh, VM managers usually work with disk images, like raw disk images, um, like like something with GPT inside and then XT4 or whatever inside of that. Um, you can use CA sync very nicely to to download new versions of of these VM disk images um, and tell um, CA sync each time. Then you uh, it uh, shall see with the old version, and then um, really only the, the, the actual changes are are um, uh, placed in the new file. And everything else is reflected, right? And that's, that's that's awesome actually because you can actually deliver like huge VM images, like they can be gigabytes. And on disk, you just pay for the actual changes at the point the changes are made, and never for for how many uh, different versions you keep. But share the block, right? I hope. People got that about the reference. There was one question related to indexes because I have like a huge file system and very small changes that I do a backup every day. Is that the duplication and the index? If the index grows big, like every backup would be an index? Um, so the question is regarding uh, with basically the disk usage of the index itself. So um, right now, I mean, the index are tiny, right? Like you, you saw that. Um, and I'm pretty sure that if you, if you um, archive terabytes of data with CA sync, then the index file will grow. I mean, simple mass uh, calculation that, yeah, you know the average block size and you know um, uh, uh, how large the shasm is and then you can multiply how large the file will be. Um, there are some systems which, um, I don't know, which people who have, uh, spend too much time on their computers um, implemented, where they take the index file and uh, use them, consider that the serialization of the next level, and then split the index file up as if it was the serialization, and do that as long until they only get one hash back, if you follow what I mean, right? And um, I thought about doing the same thing because it has this like computer science-y, oh, this is cool, I can just do this all on five levels instead of just one. And then I decided that that's ridiculous and that's just masturbation. And uh, <laughs> I don't think that's really necessary. So I don't know, we can revisit that. If it really becomes a problem that the index file grows a large, maybe we do something about that. But um, until then, like it's like an exception. You know, we need to go one level deeper. Sure, we can do that, but also we cannot. Um, and I don't know, I don't see the point in it. But uh, I, don't know. I do have some sympathies for the computer science point of view that this is sexy, I don't know. But uh, also I try to actually write usable software and simple software. Because I mean, if you don't do that stuff, I can tell you that in like five minutes on my slides. Um, if I start doing this, then we do that on the same level again and again and again, then it gets too easily to come back. Um, uh, CA sync is able to do everything locally, obviously, but it can also acquire chunks and indexes uh, by FTP, HTTP, HTTPS, and FTP, SFTP. Um, like I guess it's what you expect. Like it's it's actually links to curl, and so in theory it could do anything that libcurl can do. Um, uh, though I actually, yeah, I mean in theory it could even get your data from a uh, uh, what's it called? Um, 
all the weird protocols that, that curl supports. Uh, what, what, what's that called? The, the Goffer. It could use Goffer. <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, I did not enable that part. Um, but sure, um, yeah. Uh, another kind of nice thing is uh, when it replays, it can actually make some changes, or when it um, zips things up again as well, it can do UID git shift, which sounds pretty useless. Um, I mean, what it does basically is it adds or subtracts a fixed value from every user ID and group ID in the directory tree. Um, that's only useful for containers that use username chasing, and uh, it's kind of nice, but yeah, also pretty useless unless you use username chasing. Um, one thing that I really wanted to point out is, so CSync can be used to uh, uh, make these images and to extract them again, but you can also do this. This basically is a command line where you say, CSync, make me a device described by that index file of a block device. And what happens if you invoke that, and I would probably show that to you, but now I'm a bit afraid because that failed so horribly. Um, uh, what did that actually does if you invoke that is, um, bam, a new block device shows up, and it's called uh, my block, a def my block image, and uh, it's going to be, it's like def SDA. And uh, what happens in the background is that uh, CA Sync will start downloading the chunks from the beginning, slowly, blah, blah, blah. But uh, as you access the block device, right, you can, you can mount it, you can use CF disk on it, whatever you want to like use on it. As you access it, it will then read the chunks that you request as priority first. So basically, it's a really nice way how you can expose a remote file system locally um, with okay performance. I mean, it's not very optimized, but it probably could be optimized quite a bit. Um, and have it really show up as a local block device. It's a little bit like iSCSI, but with security and shit. Um, well, um, all of this is about having like the question was, what about write access? All of this is about reproducibility, making guarantees about immutability. And immutability, reproducibility, all these things are the opposite of write, write access, right? But that said, I mean, um, I could think that maybe one could put together something here where you build a, like, a, like a system that knows transactions where basically when, actually, when you actually write something, we we'll collect them and then do a new index file and upload that and, and things like that. But that's, uh, I don't know, it's not, it's not in the focus of what I want it to be right now, uh, but people can build whatever they want. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, all this stuff here, actually, like the, the sources are written in a style that they're supposed to become a shared library sooner or later, um, so that people can build whatever they want out of this on every level. Like, I don't really give you the, the, the high level access only, I give you actually the the, the low level access on the series H and the low level access on the chunking and so on because I kind of hope that people pick this up and build shit out of it that's interesting. Like it's, it's supposed to be different from Git for example because Git never had the same library so people could glue things together with shell but not on the C level but I think it, like for example I want really that people instead of doing this stuff they can also write a GNOME VFS module if they like or some module for HTTP that um, trans uh, for, for Apache that, or Nginx whatever you like um, that um, in the background requires requires resources for the network to do that. But uh, yeah, anyway, then one question. How does it work with it use views? Uh, so M MKDEF, like I mean, the next slide is this. Um, and the next slide is mount. And so the difference here, of course, is again, CABX is the image file of a block device, but CADX is the image file of uh, the, the, the serialization of the directory tree. So this command will actually take that thing and mount it to you locally on some directory, in this case, slash some slash where, and then as you access through that, it will get the chunks and, and expose that. That uses fuse. Uh, this uses NBD. You know NBD? Um, NBD is the network block device. It's something that has been in the Linux kernel for ages. And if you ask me, it's awful. Well, fuse is also awful. But um, it works for this purpose. So um, uh, the, the original idea of NBD was actually to, to uh, like iSCSI, where you basically can expose a remote block device locally. Um, of course, the way NBD works, it really, every request is passed directly to the other side. Um, I use that simply to, to um, talk to my local CA sync instance, and then this local CA sync instance does all the magic with figuring out the chunks, and then only downloading the chunks, and decompressing the chunks, and things like that. So, um, it uses some concepts of the kernel driver that NBD has, but it uses nothing of the NBD user um, code or protocol or anything like that. It just 
um, it takes benefit of the fact that the kernel provides a way how user space can implement block devices um, by means of the kernel side of MBD. And another question. So the index file knows where the chunks are stored. Sorry? So the index file describes where the chunks the, the are. What? The what? Yeah, yeah, the index file, yeah. So it describes where the chunks are, like really? The location? Well, no, what, so, so the question is uh, what the, does the index file precisely describe? So the index file contains a little bit of metadata and then really just contains um, information like a list of hashes plus their offsets. The offset information is entirely redundant. The only reason why the offset information is in there is in order to um, have random access. Because again, this is not an equal block size thing. It's a, it's a, it's a variant block size thing. So if I want to jump to the serialization position uh, 55555, five, 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 then the only way to do that is finding the right block where it is, and that I can do that by bisection if I always store the, the offset in there. But other than that, there's no information there. There's no information about URLs, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Um, the, the idea is always, um, the implicit idea, is that when you invoke CA sync and tell it use that index file, that um, the store is located basically at the same place but called default.csdr. That's the defaults. Um, what you actually can do is, uh, on the command line when you invoke it, you can specify dash dash store equals and specify any URL you like, and that's where it will look. And you can specify as many stores as you want, and it will try them all um, uh, one after the other. Like if the first store doesn't have something, it will use the next one. The idea basically is that um, if you're a big organization, you can have a local store of stuff that people already download or frequently use, and, and then if that's not viable, then you actually go to the internet and get the old other stuff. But um, yeah, the, the implicit default is if you don't speci specify anything, um, uh, CSync looks at the URL and generates a different URL <laughs> from that where it seems to, to put that stuff. Do you have authentication in CSync for the download? Uh, so the question was regarding authentication for the, for the downloads. Um, uh, well, I don't implement HTTP, so the libcurl implements HTTP. Libcurl really supports everything under the thumb. They do HTTP2, and actually CSync automatically does uh, support HTTP2. It's really nice, it does pipelining and whatnot. It's really cool to see that I don't really have to care about that. Um, so no, we don't do authentication because I don't know if I actually have to enable that explicitly in, in, uh, um, uh, in libcurl. If that requires no explicit enabling, then it will just work. Uh, so. Well, the, the question is, let's say you need to disable certificate checks so with curl, you say dash k. Yeah. Do some, we allow passing in curl options? We support very little, like, like we allow you to configure very little, but that's mostly because we didn't need it and there was no reason to expose it so far. Like right now you can set the, the bandwidth limit for downloads, uh, but I mean if you want to disable the SSL certificate change uh, to checks, um, I'd be happy to take a patch um, that Fernand's doing that. Um, so it's yeah, it's supposed to grow and whatever people need, right? Um, yeah. Does it support a button? That's a very good question. Um, so the question was regarding whether it supports Avahi. Um, Avahi being this other thing that I wrote once upon a time. <laughs> it's a service discovery thing, um, which basically allows you to, to, to find services on the local network. And it's actually an interesting idea, like combining this stuff with that, right? Like because um, you know, if you have a world where you have lots of similar devices deployed in some network, like, I don't know, the thermostat for all the, the, the heating here. Um, they're all the same network, and if they all go to the internet and download their shit, that's kind of redundant, right? Like, if one is the first one to download everything, it would be much nicer if the next he uh, heating would actually, and the next thermostat would actually download it. <coughs> um, it's not implemented right now, but I think, I would probably not do it with Avahi, though, because I don't think there's a need to involve Avahi, uh, because Avahi is about service management. And I think, um, or service discovery, um, I think CA Sync would probably uh, it would make a lot of sense to implement something that just uses multicasting directly and, and looks for, for not for services, but for, for uh, actually the chunks. It will just send out a message saying, I want this chunk, this chunk, this chunk. And then the other peers will supply them if they, if they have it. So I definitely would love to implement it one day, but probably not involving it. Like, because Avahi is designed for different things, right? It has all the notification when something appears. And that's not what you want there, right? Like, there is no need to know that chunk so and so suddenly appeared on the network. Nobody will care about that until the point where you actually do a download. 
And when you do the download, then the Bennett should query it. Um, but uh, we can learn a lot from how Vahi and Vienna and these things work and then use that there. But um, doing that would be actually excellent because basically we could just do it completely magically and completely secure because again, every chunk is always has this, like we request it through the checksum. So even if you have a rogue thermostat um, that wants to give you shit, like it wants to give you a bullshit data, you can immediately go for it straight away and not um, ask anything, query anything from it. Understand anymore. Um, so yeah, it's definitely my intention to have another backend when it's sort of HPD, we look on the local network and I can speed things up and actually, um, yeah. Like Chrome OS does that. They do it with Avahi. I'd rather Avahi, but I still wouldn't do it with Avahi because, I don't know. If, if, uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but I don't know, not everything looks like the right thing to use Avahi for. I, I think OS Street does it. Uh, we have that recently. Yeah, I wouldn't use that. But I mean, that's a different level, right? Like, uh, I have this beautiful concept of a chunk that is idiot-proof simple, right? Um, on my street, it's, things are way more complex, right? Like, because you actually have something smart with deltas and whatever else, right? So if I do on a CA sync a protocol that just asks, anybody has that chunk, I can do, implement that easily and securely and simply and, and I'm done with it while you probably have to actually talk to like and do a proper um, direct connection and actually talk something smart. I mean, it's kind of the beauty of CA sync. It's insanely easy. It actually is. So yeah. Doesn't already build a cache app, a local uh, a local cache on top of it? Uh, it does, but um, currently the cache will be deleted when you're done with it. Um, but it's definitely my intention. It's on the to list as well to make that cache um, uh, option persistent if you want to. But uh, doing that would, of course, mean that I would have to commit to the format of that cache. And while I'm happy with committing to the format of the index files and of the store, I'm not at the point yet where I want to commit to the cache. But uh, um, I mean, currently, it does all that and just removes everything. Um, not doing the removal would certainly. I mean, it's, it's actually a really good point. Like, um, one of my things that I want to build this into eventually is the backup system. You know, and backup. Um, uh, basically means that every day you run that thing and it does automatically put a couple of new chunks on the server. If we would actually um, go over your home directory every day and read every single byte, serialize it, chunk it up and so on, we waste a lot of time because we had to, to look at every single file to get the serialization back. So one thing that is very hard on the to-do list is to make that use case work where you have terabytes in your home directory um, that um, uh, there's a cache for that, right? We're basically saying that, yeah, if um, we are at that file and the end time is that and so on and so on, then that's, by the way, the hash and there's no point, you don't have to read it as long as all the end times match this rule or something like that. So caching is a good thing, right? There needs to be more of that and I definitely want to implement that uh, and it's kind of, kind of the requirement to open things up for the backup thing. But uh, for delivering images, it doesn't really matter because Images you deliver tend not to be terabytes. They tend, uh, I don't know, like I personally don't think at least, um, like IoT especially, they probably have images that don't grow above 500 megabytes, I don't know. And to doing that for 500 megabytes, uh, doing your build process doesn't really it's matter. It's useful for the network synchronization because not all of them will run CA sync at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other question? Do you put the cache in slash TMP? No, in var TMP. Well, no. It's uh, cache is actually next to the place where we have to place it in the end, uh, so that I can do smart things with the file system. Um, so it, uh, it it only places in var TMP what, where where there is no benefit of not storing in var TMP. But we never use slash temp because slash temp is for small files, and these things can grow to terabytes. Um, I still have some slides if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah, well one really nice thing that it also does is, um, you know, um, one of the, the, the areas where it's supposed to be used is IoT. Now if you do the classic IoT setup, you have this A petition, the B petition that I already mentioned. And these petitions have relatively large sizes, usually half of the CF card or whatever you have there. Um, the file system stored in these petitions are usually much smaller. 
right? That's because you want to have room for the future, for growing things, right? So I don't know, you have a two gigabyte uh, uh, SD card in there, and one gigabyte is partition one, one gigabyte is partition two, and the first one is only filled to 500 megabytes, and then you know, okay, you still have 500 megabytes to grow over the, as time progresses. Now, I mentioned that reproducibility matters a ton though for me. This is kind of conflicting, because if you would actually use SHA-256 on like the, the shell command on def SDA1 or whatever that block device is called, then it would actually um, calculate that checksum, not only of the actual file system in there, but of all the zeros that come after it, right? That's not only slow, because it reads needless data, but it's also nasty because the, the checksums will not match, right? So we added to CS Sync this little bit of smartness that if it operates on the block level, it can actually understand the super block of uh, specific file systems and uh, figure out the actual size of the thing. And then it will um, it basically fall back to the size of the block device only if it has no clue. Um, and that's kind of cool because uh, that basically means I can run CA sync digest onto some block device um, and it will actually calculate you the checksum of that file system on it and ignore all the white space that might come after it. Um, it's, it's, it's a nice little feature. I mean, we currently have support for XT3, SquatchFS, and a couple of other ones, um, but uh, it's not complete yet. Um, I think this one is like my last slide. I uh, made, made it through it mostly. Um, GC is kind of one of the obvious things that need to come next. Um, uh, yeah, eventually you want to delete images from your server, and then you need to um, remove the chunks, but because the chunks maybe referenced by a couple of indexes, you can only remove the chunks when there are really no indexes left that actually matter. Um, so the GIC algorithm isn't that difficult, it's just that I didn't implement it yet. Um, and the next thing is, if we want to make it useful for backup, then I need the caching stuff that I was uh, mentioning earlier, but it's, I also need encryption, right? Like, um, everything I talked about right now is without encryption. The assumption is that if you deliver container images or anything like that, um, sure, do encryption on the HTTPS level, but there is not really a need to, to um, uh, encrypt the actual data itself because the protocols already cover that. For backup, and a couple of other use cases that doesn't cut it anymore. For backup, um, it's really essential that the, that the data that you backup on that server um, is uh, uh, encrypted uh, with your key and that server doesn't know the key. And uh, yeah, it's um, just coming out there, like, I mean, the main, goal of purpose of CA Sync so far was image delivery and backup is kind of very different but also very similar use case, right? Because um, if you do image delivery, the assumption is always that you have a lot of very similar directory trees. Um, that's very similar for backup, right? Like you have a lot of very similar directory trees because you do a backup every day. Um, so that's kind of where it fits together. CA Sync is supposed to be, not cover all use cases in the world, but it's supposed to cover still a couple, like a range of use cases and backup and image delivery are certainly both of them are supposed to be covered. Um, yeah, if we do, if you do the backup stuff, and I'm, I definitely want to, um, then things are actually not that hard to do. And what we need to change is instead of actually calculating the SHA sum of the blocks, what we do is we um, uh, uh, calculate the MAC of these blocks, meaning a keyed hash function, where the key of the hash function is actually a crypto tree that you want to um, use for the backup. And we will have to uh, encrypt the individual blocks, which is pretty obvious how to do that. Um, and the, the, the chunking algorithm needs to also be keyed so that um, uh, the sizes of the chunks do not reveal information about what might be in that stream. But these strings are already sufficient and we have a nice backup system. Um, it's high on my to-do list to actually implement that. There are backup systems like that already in place. Again, much of what, the, like pretty much everything that I was talking about is not news. Like, it's all uh, implemented elsewhere in some form already. Um, one backup system that does pretty much what I'm describing here is TarSnap. TarSnap is from some OpenBSD guy, and he actually made it business. It's not open source. It's, 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 it feels like open source, but it isn't. Uh, it's his way of living. Like, he lives off that. But TarSnap kind of does the same thing for backup. Like, he doesn't care about image delivery, he only cares about backup. Um, and because um, tar snap is written by the guy who wrote libtar, he doesn't really depart from tar, because tar is everything for him. So it doesn't do, uh, doesn't have the reproducibility in the, in the random access so nicely, it doesn't do 
yeah, these kind of things. But um, otherwise, like from the cryptography, from the backup perspective, it's excellent. Um, and I don't know, in, in this way, CSYNC will get a little bit closer to that model. And there are other systems like that as well. Like, I mean, again, like, uh, if you, when I posted on the internet, one of the most frequent replies I got was, this is exactly like project so-and-so. And why don't you just use shell script in that project? Why do you come up with something new? And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I tried to do my homework and figure out all the systems that work in some way like this. But there's no tool that can, you can actually use with image delivery that, that's this nice. Um, so uh, yeah, now the ideas aren't different. That the way the, the, the things are put together that is different. Then another thing that I might want to do eventually is, um, uh, is uh, automatic secure uh, um, home synchronization. So it's kind of similar to the backup thing. Like if you do regular um, store your home directory on some server, um, then you can replay it on some other server, uh, um, uh, like on some other client um, uh, in automatic kind of transaction ways. Um, uh, there's, yeah, um, and this would be excellent for that because yeah, if you do this kind of automatic synchronization, you'll have a lot of copies. Like it's a topic that, that uh, what's it called, um, like, like Google Drive and uh, Dropbox kind of currently cover. But uh, it could be built on this actually, I think, very nicely. And the big benefit would be that the server um, can be playing HTTP and you don't have to trust it because all the stuff that we store there would be encrypted before we store it there. So yeah, that's, that's actually really my last slide. Uh, this is the, if you want to know more about this, like the first URL that LaTeX decided to line break so weirdly um, is the blog story. I had a uh, assumption, like a guess, that many of you already read that. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, the same thing I just talked about, but in text form. Um, and the other one is the GitHub URL where you actually find the source code. It's been packaged by a number of distributions right now. And uh, uh, it has a long history already of development and does a shitload of stuff, but then again, I only tagged version 0.1, uh, like the first version, very recently. Um, so, um, yeah. and. Uh, this bug that I just showed you is not in the version that we tagged that came after that. But uh, I'm working on getting it out. But again, yeah, it's new software, so it's probably not going to be perfect. And not many people test it besides me. We have a test suite that finds a lot of things for us, but of course, um, a test suite is one thing, and in real life, you do just another. Uh, yeah? What's the license on the, do you have a library for that? Sorry? What is the license on that? The GPL. LGPL, I think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that. So, yeah. Um, I actually want that my stuff stays free. Um, yeah. How stable is the library for us? Uh, like, I, 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 the, the reason I didn't announce it any earlier is because I wanted to be sure that I um, uh, can keep compatibility with the binary format. That said, since I did the announcement, people uh, gave me a couple of ideas, though I will probably add extensions, but I tend to do them in a compatible way. So um, I do not give guarantees officially, but inefficiently I can tell you I don't see I will break it. Anytime. So in theory, it should also support Python and encrypted, just encrypted uh, block device, if I have small changes. Yes, like it's it's all about locality. Like if, yeah. if, if changes don't 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 explode all across the device, the uh, CSYNC thing should work nicely. Like I mean, the, the thing is, like eventually, what I want to put together is, is like I just want to commoditize how how a building system works, right? Like because regardless if you build an IoT device or a container or a server or whatever else, I think uh, we live in a world where that stuff should just be automated and then just work, and there shouldn't be different delivery tools for containers and IoT and and then and, and servers, it should, all, should always be the same trusted, um, like, like, like with, 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 with trustability built in, reproducibility built in right from the beginning. So I'm kind of like, this is one building block, a very generic building block um, that you can use. I mean, again, by the way, this is not part of systemd. It's part of the systemd umbrella project on GitHub, but it's, uh, it's actually an independent source tree. You can use it without systemd even. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why I would do that. Mark yourself out. Um, and uh, uh, it's Linux only right now. Um, I'm happy to take patches on this one for portability to other Unixes, but only to Unixes that are somewhat recent, where like things like Open Ed, for those who know, are supported. I don't really want to have like this huge compatibility if in there. 
I'm ha happy though is if it has a small bit of coverability of Jeffrey. Um, yeah, so uh, that's like the, the, the disk format. They, they, like for some of the bits that we actually save and restore are things like DOS um, and file attributes. Like for those who remember that system hidden archive and read only. Um, so it actually has support in the archive file format so that you could make use of it in Windows too. You might wonder why did I do that? The reason why I did that is that I actually wanted to be useful to um, uh, serialize a, a, my laptop properly. And on my laptop, I always will have a FAT partition because EFI requires that it's the ESP. So my idea was, okay, then let's do that properly and actually store the metadata that is available on FAT in the same way as we care about the metadata that we have on, on other FAS or XT4. So yeah, there's a certain level of portability in the concept somewhere. And, uh, yeah, there's nothing blocks people from implementing that on other operating systems. Or, again, I wouldn't be willing to add support for recent other Unixes that have open at this kind of stuff. Because it's, like this stuff is really built in a way that um, I try to make use of what Unix has these days. And Unix today is much nicer than it was in the 80s. And I don't really see the point in developing stuff for Unix in the 80s. Nobody can reasonably run that anyway. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Other than that, what time is it? Um, 